Um, let me uh, introduce um, uh, our next speaker, um, uh, Patrick uh, Melis. Uh, sorry, if I have pronounced <laughs> incorrect. Or, uh, uh, was quite close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he um, he come from um, uh, Brandenburg, the University of Technology uh, in Germany. T T U uh, Brandenburg, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, today he is going to uh, talk about um, uh, sub defense association uh, of sparsity promoting functions on uh, Lebergue um, uh, species. It, it's your state now, Pachit. Thank you very much for the introduction. And yeah, good morning or good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk. I'm a little bit uh, concerned with optimal control this uh, at this time. And yeah a little bit of mixture of optimal control and variation analysis. So as the title of the talk suggests, I basically want to compute here exact formulas for sub-differentials of sparsity promoting functions which appear in optimal control. And I want to derive optimality conditions from that. And this talk is based on two very different works. One is together with Alex Kruger. Uh, this one is, yeah, this work is basically responsible for the optimality conditions we obtain in the end. And the actual computation of these sub-differentials uh, uh, I did together with Gerd Wachsmuth from the PTU. Okay, so what I'm going to do, um, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, you a little bit to the topic of uh, sparsity promotion, optimal control, and I will a little bit speak about the basics uh, in variation analysis and functional analysis. I need to proceed in yeah, some preliminary section. I will um, yeah, present these precise formulas of the sub-differentials of interest in the third part of the talk. I will address optimality conditions afterwards. And yeah, just a quick uh, what next section will close the talk in the end in order to visualize what we can do with that and what are open questions. So that's the route. And let me start with the introduction. So, um, okay, here we are. So let's start with a very basic uh, optimal control problem in Lebesgue spaces. So we have some domain omega of finite positive Lebesgue measure, and we want to yeah, minimize some target type objective function over a set of feasible controls UAV. For simplicity, you may imagine that this is just a set of box constraints in L2. And in the objective function, as I already said, we have this target type structure. So on the one hand, we want to achieve a target YD in some Hilbert space as close as possible, um, where um, U enters some, for example, dynamical system and the associated solution operator uh, is then this S. So SU is what uh, is assigned to the control after the dynamics. So this is the one uh, goal we want to achieve. On the other hand, we want to, yeah, yeah maybe we want to uh, control the system with low or, or not that much energy afford. So there is also a regularization term with respect to the control. And the sigma then controls uh, the value of uh, the control action in this objective functional. So that's a standard optimal control problem. And yeah, the problem with that is typically in applications, we want controls to be sparse, which means that these uh, functions u should vanish on large parts of the domain, for example, for energy efficiency. But typically, if we only solve this optimal control problem, as you see it on the top of the slide, it happens that these controls are typically non-sparse. Um, so they work basically on uh, the overall domain, and that is not, not desirable. So what one generally does in order to achieve this sparsity is one adds another term in the objective function, some integral uh, functional, and uh, you see it here in OCS, where we integrate some function g, which is a value added u of x over the overall domain. And this g, this choice of g then, yeah, induces the sparse behavior of the optimal control. And I'd like to introduce to you some potential choices of this functional G, which are popular in the literature. The first one is just um, the absolute value, which means that this integral uh, function reduces to the standard L1 norm, so the, so the, the, the Lebesgue L1 norm. And as soon as uh, the set of feasible controls is convex, 
And if your operator S is linear, then this even leads to a convex uh, sparsity promoting optimal control problem. And that is fine from a theoretical analysis side. But in practice, it turns out that this L1 norm often yields controls which are still not sparse enough for certain guys from applications. As why other uh, potential suggestions were discussed. For example, a second case, this so called L0 norm, which is actually no norm, um, where we only set uh, the value of the function g to zero if we are precisely at zero, and otherwise it is one. So, of course, this promotes sparsity because only at zero we get value zero, and otherwise we are far away from it. But as you all see, this function is highly discontinuous, and this leads to yeah. issues when trying to solve this problem in practice. So yeah, nice sparsity effects here, but difficult to solve. So there is a compromise often done by choosing um, g as the absolute value to the p, where p is a number between 0 and 1. And yeah, then this, is, this yields better sparsity than just the L1 norm. But we still have continuity of the of the objective function, which is better. But what you still have here with this um, yeah, absolute value to the p is that you lose Lipschitz this. So the integrand in this sparsity promoting function is not Lipschitz, and that is yeah dangerous in variation analysis where Lipschitzianity is often uh, an assumption we need for the calculus. And that is basically what I want to address in this talk. So we want to compute subdifferentials of sparsity promoting functions on the one hand for this uh, one based on the l0 norm we call the functional q as zero this s is the index of the Lebesgue space of the underlying Lebesgue space and we want to restrict ourselves here to the setting where s ranges between one and infinity in order to stay in the setting of s plot spaces and on the other hand we want to do the same for the functional q as p where p is between zero and one, and then this is just the function related to the absolute value to the p um, as an integrand. And the thing is, um, we came up with the observation that there exists a lot of papers dealing with uh, computation of subdifferentials of integral functions, um, but all these papers uh, cannot be applied actually to these simple functionals because we do not have the Tritianity of the integrand, and those papers would who do not work with the Lipschitzianity assumption uh, basically only yield rough upper estimates of the subdifferentials, which are also not uh, quite close to the real subdifferentials we obtained here. So that is a basic finding. And at the end, um, when having these subdifferentials, we still do not can address uh, optimality conditions directly because um, both, uh, so even uh, so, at least in the setting of constraint optimization, because then we basically have to deal with the fact that two discontinuous functions or non Lipschitz functions at least enter um, the analysis, namely the sparsity promoting functional and the indicator function of the feasible set. Both are non Lipschitz and both are not so called SNEC, sequentially normally epi compact, which basically destroys applicability of the limiting variational calculus. So we have to find another way to get optimality conditions here. So that's for the introduction. And now I'd like to start uh, presenting you some results. I will briefly go through the preliminaries. I think they are, they are known. So for the variational analysis side, um, we only need to clarify which type of subdifferentials I actually want to compute. And therefore, uh, let me be quick introduce r here uh, a number between one and infinity just to be the conjugate coefficient associated with the s the index of the Lebesgue space of our interest and then what we want to compute here are the so-called Frege subdifferential of the sparsity promoting function you see the definition on the slide it's the standard Frege subdifferential most of you should be familiar with and based on these Frege subdifferential um, we can yeah take two limiting procedures in order to get a so-called limiting subdifferential. The first one is the standard limiting subdifferential, where we basically consider weak limits of Frege subgradients uh, as long as the input uh, u converges to the reference point, the limiting subdifferential. 
and the so-called singular subdifferential, where in contrast to the definition of the limiting subdifferential, another sequence of uh, real numbers TK appears falling to zero, which rescales the Frechet subgradients in some sense that TK eta K converted weakly to the subgradient of eta. And this um, yeah, singular subdifferential um, turned out to be valuable when trying to characterize Lipschitzian properties of functionals. What I mean with that, so um, if the functional of interest is actually Lipschitz at the reference point, then this singular subdifferential reduces to zero and the converse direction holds whenever the functional is has this SNEC property at U bar. Okay, this is not given here, but nevertheless, it's nice to know that this converse is also true. So that is what we mean. And um, yeah, before starting with the analysis, I'd like to uh, mention some continuity properties of the integral functions of our interest. So the, the functional Q as zero based on the L zero norm is lower semi-continuous. This can be easily shown by Fatou's lemma. And for P strictly between zero and one, this functional Q as P is uniformly continuous. That will be important later on. And let me mention that QSP is not so-called weakly sequentially lower semi-continuous, which is yeah, quite a desirable property in optimal control because it enjoys, uh, in some sense, existence of optimal solutions. That is not given here. And that causes our yeah, sparsity promoting optimal control problem to may possess no solutions but still in applications, uh, guys tend to address this problem in order to get some sparse solutions, um, um, yeah, which might be desirable applications. So just a quick reminder here that existence of solutions is, is not given necessarily. And um, I already mentioned that the integral functions there might be non-Lipschitz because the integrants are non-Lipschitz. Good, that's for the continuity properties of the functionals of interest. And now um, I'd like to introduce to you a definition of so-called slowly decreasing functions, which at the first glance seems to be a little bit artificial, but in this uh, property is actually necessary in order to characterize the Frechet subdifferential of the functional Q as zero. So what does slowly decreasing in Lebesgue spaces mean. The definition is given on the slide. So we fix some S between one and infinity and some functional U bar in the, in the Lebesgue space of S and call this function uh, slowly decreasing of order S, SSD for short, if for any sequence omega K of measurable subsets of the, the support of the function U bar, we know that if the measure of this set tends to zero, then we can rescale these measures by some kind of yeah, um, S, so the big S norm of U bar, but restricted to this set omega K. And this then still tends to zero, which means that this yeah, re uh, restricted uh, norm of U bar to the set omega K converges much slower to this uh, to this uh, to zero than lambda of omega k does and this somehow means that u bar tends to zero on its support quite slow okay that is potentially difficult to understand and this definition is quite hard to check in practice because it says that something has to hold for each sequence of omega k case. So yeah, we want first to get a more tangible imagination of what this property actually means. And we came up with, with this nice characterization result here. So a function is SSD basically if a certain limit uh, tends to zero, which depends on the conjugate coefficient R and certain choices of these omega k's from the original definition which just measure where u bar or the absolute value of u bar is strictly positive, but less or equal some yeah, threshold gamma. This is much more easier to check and helps us to get yeah, a glimpse of imagination what this means. I prepared a little example for you here, what SSD means 
for a very basic function. So we consider just the unit ball in RD and some positive real alpha. We consider the function u bar, which is basically uh, the Euclidean norm of the argument to the alpha on the unit ball. Clearly, this function is, is very nice and belongs to the, uh, to the Lebesgue space LS uh, for each of the choices for alpha. And now we apply our theorem in order to check when this function is actually SSD. And it turns out that this is the case if and only if alpha over D plus one over S is less, strictly less than one. And in the one dimensional case, we can thus obtain that U bar is a 2SD function if and only if this constant alpha is strictly smaller than a half. And I prepared two little figures for you. On the left, you see a function which has this property to be 2SD, so slowly decreasing of order two. And on the right, you see a function which does not have this property. And coming back to the, to the pictures from the beginning of the talk, where I spoke about sparsity promoting functions, a similar effect can be seen here. So the, the figure on the left is somehow related to, to a square root function, which yeah, is related to the integrand in this functional QSP for P between zero and one, which is known to be sparsely promoting. And on the right, you see um, yeah, some kind of parabola, which is not uh, used for sparsity promotion, but for regularization purposes. So we are more interested in, in, the, in the figure on the left. And as I said, this is actually an 2SD function here. Okay, now after these preparations, I will start uh, in presenting to you the formulas for the subdifferentials. So the, the proofs of these theorems here are actually based on standard tools uh, of analysis in Lebesgue space, which means uh, basically we often need uh, Helder's inequality to proceed or um, dominated convergence or Fatum or all these nice standard results, but the proofs are still quite technical because they yeah, are based on the yeah, many, many cases we have to distinguish there. So I will not speak about the technical details of the proof, but I only want to present the results here. So let's start with the subdifferentials of QS0. Again, this is the integral function based on the L0 norm. Therein, we obtain that the Frechet sub subdifferential of a given U bar is First of all, empty if u bar is not an SSD function, and if u bar actually is such an SSD function, then the subdifferential comprises all functions either from LR, which only do not vanish at those parts of the domain where u bar actually is zero. And when taking the, mid, the limit, sorry, in order to get the limiting and the singular subdifferential, this SSD property is basically lost. And we get that the limiting and the singular subdifferential are the same and comprise all EDAs in LR, which only do not vanish on the domain where U bar vanishes. Okay. From these formulas, uh, we can, or at least from the last formula, um, we can get at least partially uh, a characterization of points where QS0 is Lipschitz or where it's not Lipschitz. And yeah, basically we can show that this functional QS0 is nowhere Lipschitz. Let's turn our attention now to another situation where P uh, is between zero and one, and we want to consider the subdifferential of QSP. And there the situation is a little different. You see it here. Uh, first of all, now the Frechet and the limiting subdifferential are actually the same. They comprise all EDAs in LR such that EDA is uh, P times absolute value of U bar to the P minus two times U bar everywhere or almost everywhere where U bar does not vanish. And the singular subdifferential of this function is actually the same as the singular subdifferential of QS zero, which is uh, based on this fact that the singular subdifferential definition uh, comprises the sequence T car pushing all the Frechet subgradients uh, down to some extent. Okay, I'd like to I'd like to mention here that um, the Frechet and the limiting subdifference still might be empty for this uh, functional QSP. Namely, um, I'd like to point out that this function uh, absolute value of U bar to the P minus two uh, times U bar 
is more or less the same as u bar to the p minus one, which means p minus one is negative. And if u bar approaches zero on its support, this means that this function eta's, which are in the subdifferential here, possess some singularities. And then one has to find out for which kind of uh, yeah, singularity we are still in LR. And if the singularity is not in LR, then basically it may happen that the subdifferential is empty. So still we get some situations here where these subdifferentials do not provide any information because they are empty. Okay, so that is one thing I'd like to mention. And again, we get the same result as for QS0. This functional QSP is also nowhere Lipschitz continuous. Again, this is a disastrous observation when thinking about uh, a calculus in variational analysis. Nevertheless, we can come up with uh, optimality conditions for these optimal control problems of our inference. And yeah, let's let's take a look how it works. So I will start with the unconstrained case, which is which is easy. So I'm fixing s between one and infinity, some p between zero and one. Zero is allowed here. So also the very the discontinuous sparsely promoting function is considered. We need a Frechet differentiable function f from ls to r. You may think of this sparsity uh, of this target type objective uh, function you saw on the first slide in the talk. And what we want to do is we want to just minimize f plus qsp. And I hope you know that if we have a minimizer of this problem, and we know by Fermat's rule that zero is an element of the Frechet sub differential of f plus qsp, because f is uh, a Frechet differential, we can apply some sum rule to that. And this yields the following optimality condition. So we fix the local minimizer of the sum. And then we know in case where p is zero, that this local minimizer u bar is an SSD function and the gradient of f uh, u bar vanishes almost everywhere where u bar is non-zero. And in case where p is strictly between zero and one, um, we first know that u bar to the p minus one restricted to the support of u bar is an LR function and that the gradient of this function f at u bar equals minus p times absolute value of u bar to the p minus two times u bar almost everywhere on the support. So these are the information we get in the unconstrained case. Now let's consider the constrained case. Again, we consider s between one and infinity. And for some reasons I will point out just in a second, uh, p has to be strictly larger than zero here. We need a continuously Frechet differentiable function f from ls to r. And the constraints are not of arbitrary type. What we need here are box constraints, which means we need uh, some given functions ua and ub, satisfying ua less or equal ub almost everywhere, such that u is chosen between uh, ua and ub almost everywhere on omega. When defining the set of feasible controls, as UAD, we can rewrite this optimization problem P as the unconstrained minimization of F plus QSP plus the indicator. Okay, and now we do the same as in the in, on the slide before. We first of all apply the Fermat rule in order to get that zero is an element of the Frechet subdifferential of F plus QSP plus the indicator, and then we can split the differentiable part away from this and arrive at this optimality condition here. So the negative gradient in the Frechet subdifferential of QSP plus the indicator. But now uh, we do not know how to go further because um, yeah, QSP and the indicator are not SMEC and both are non Lipschitz. So we are lost here. Even if we replace the Frechet by the limiting subdifferential, no calculus rule gives us a result in order to represent the subdifferential in terms of its components. So what we now do is um, we choose a completely different approach in order to come up with optimality conditions by so-called uh, approximate stationarity conditions of this constrained uh, optimization problem. And then we take the limit in this uh, stationarity system 
and exploit the nice structure of convergence in the big space in order to characterize the limit in pointwise way. So what does this mean? Um, yeah, the approximate stationarity condition I have in mind here, which, which is used, is given in this lemma. So what do we have? We consider the s space setting and want to minimize a uniformly continuous function phi over a closed set omega. And if some omega, uh, some w bar is a local minimizer of phi restricted to omega, then we know that for each epsilon, we find uh, w1 and w2 in an epsilon ball around w bar, where w2 also comes from omega, such that the function value of phi at w1 is close to phi uh, at w bar. Uh, at most epsilon far away. And then we get some kind of fuzzy um, yeah, stationarity here. So zero is an element of the Frechet subdifferential of the objective plus Frechet subdifferential of the indicator of the, of the constraint set, which basically is the Frechet normal code. And we get this epsilon dual ball here, which makes the optimality condition a little fuzzy. But what you see is, uh, we can choose each uh, every epsilon positive we want here, which means we also can drive epsilon to zero. And this means that we get approximate stationarity. We come as close as we want to the actual minimizer W bar. And that is a fine, uh, fine observation here. The new thing about this lemma here is that uh, yeah, optimality conditions of this type can be obtained easily from very old theory from the 1980s of Alex and Boris. Uh, as soon as phi is Lipschitzian. But in a recent paper of Alex and, and myself, we obtained that this approximate stationarity holds in much more general situations. And Alex will go into the details than tomorrow. Um, for me, I just want to mention here that the result can be generalized much further. But for our purposes, this year is enough to proceed. And as I said, we are now in position to apply this approximate stationarity condition to the constrained optimal control problem. And we do not uh, choose arbitrary epsilons in this, in this uh, procedure, but we choose some zero sequence, for example, one over K. Then we get this sequences, we can take the limit and what we come up at the end is this optimality condition here. So if U bar is a local minimizer of the problem and the control bounds uh, satisfy a certain assumption, then we get these pointwise characterizations here. So the negative gradient either is P times absolute value of U bar to the P minus two times U bar, as soon as U bar does not vanish and ranges strictly between the control bounds. And if we are at the bounds, some at least some inequalities can be shown to hold for this uh, gradient. These optimality conditions I presented to you do not uh, provide any information about the gradient of f at u bar as soon as u bar is zero. That has to be admitted. So there is a large gap of information there. But it has to be uh, observed that if the control u bar approaches zero, then our optimality conditions somehow give information about the speed on how fast uh, the control actually approaches zero. Because um, even if the SSD property is not given because we are in the constraint setting and we cannot rely on Frechet subdifferential, we get this regularity issue regarding U bar to the P minus one on the support of U bar. Okay, and my last slide, I just want to mention some extensions here. So in order to apply this um, setting or this, this results to the setting of um, image processing, for example, uh, we have to think about considering the overall theory in the setting of Sobolev spaces. And then the question arises, what happens to these uh, sparsity promoting functionals if we just want to analyze them in, in the Sobolev space W1S, for example. Then the nice thing is that the functions turn out to be weakly lower semi-continuous and the existence of solutions is clear, but due to the more difficult structure of the Zobolev space, it, not, it is not quite clear how the subdifferentials of these functionals then look like. Another thing is that this kind of sparsity promoting terms also can be applied to the weak gradient of functions in Zobolev spaces. Again, for example, for edge-preserving uh, uh, edge image processing, this would be interesting. And a final question one like to raise here is 
um, yeah, our, our computations of the subdifferentials were based on quite basic uh, yeah, tools from functional analysis. So is it possible to apply these techniques to other or more general integral functionals in order to get sharp formulas for subdifferentials of integral functions? Yeah, and with that, I'd like to close my talk. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And yeah, if there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them now. Thank, thank you, uh, Pashik, for the nice talk. And uh...